Okay, our next session is uh, is uh, this part two of roadcraft engines, and uh, this time we we'll look at uh, elements of the turbo shaft uh, performance. So this is what we have. It is a summary of what uh, we discussed in this part. So we we'll look first at the turbo shaft uh, engine specifications and engine ratings. Is they certified? We we'll look at certification issues uh, for uh, for uh, you know, civil civil engines and also for military engines. Uh, we'll discuss operational effects on uh, turbo shaft. So the number of hours that you operate in uh, clean or uh, dirty environments will have a, a you know a consequence on on the type of uh, or the amount of power you can uh, you can extract over time. So that will limit over time also the performance of your aircraft. And then we'll look at the basics of turbo shaft simulation. This is a this is an item of research just in case someone is interested uh, how we go about uh, simulating uh, engine aero engine performance. And final look uh, uh, very briefly at the engine deterioration effects. So first uh, we have uh, a turbo shaft power ratings. So if you go into the manufacturer's website, so if you go into the certification documents that I'll discuss separately, the manufacturers will provide uh, different uh, different uh, power ratings. First of all, we'll give you uninstalled engine because obviously if the manufacturer engines they don't know how the engines are going to be installed, what kind of uh, uh, losses you, you will encounter. Once the engine uh, is installed on the airframe, uh, you know whether these are uh, losses at the intake, uh, losses uh, at uh, at um, at the exhaust, and so on. So it's it's actually a very difficult thing to do in absence in absence of any of any realistic data. So they will only give you the uninstalled engine performance. The reference conditions are always standard day standard day on a, on a sea level, therefore you know zero altitude and the 15 degrees on the ground, uh, standard pressure. And then we'll give you some operational requirements. There are a number of key ratings that we're given that depending on the size of the engine. So first of all is the maximum continuous power, which is the power you can extract if you were to operate the engine uh, basically, you know, uh, unlimited, uh, subject to there being uh, obviously um, uh, uh, jet fuel. There would be the maximum takeoff power, which is generally limited to five minutes. There is the march maximum emergency power, which is limited either to 30 seconds or two minutes. Sometimes they also give you the normal cruise power. I'm not sure why they would give you the normal cruise power if you don't know exactly what the engine is doing on which aircraft, but you find sometimes the normal cruise power is conventional, given a 75% of maximum continuous power, or 60% of maximum continuous power. It is not a very meaningful uh, power rating. What is more rating is maximum continuous power, maximum takeoff power, and maximum emergency power. So the maximum emergency power is generally higher than uh, the previous two, and uh, then they, that reflects the fact that the, you know for a very short time you can give a boost to the fuel flow in order to you know increase the power and get out of a dangerous situation where you just need to recover the aircraft from uh, you know possibly I don't know stall situation or whatever you need to to avoid the bad weather or turbulence. Uh, there are there are countless examples of why you would need uh, an emergency power power supply. So the engine certification is under the remit of international organizations. The EASA is uh, is the authority within Europe. Uh, until uh, last year, they were the authority also for the United Kingdom, but I think now it is going to be replaced by the Civil Aviation, uh, um, which is CAA based uh, at Gatwick Airport. And it would be the Federal Administration in, in the United States, which is essentially in North America. U.S. military, there will be the U.K. military, there will be other military aviation uh, uh, regulations like in Russia and China and so on. So each of these organizations will issue, you know, engine or, or aircraft certification. So the type certificate may may contain lots of, of, of information, some of which is actually very useful. For example, the engine architecture, which implies, you know, the number of stages of compressor, the number of stages of turbine and so on. The all power ratings, which I was describing shortly before. The engine speeds, which are the RPM of uh, the gas turbine, the, the power, the power turbine, and uh, and uh, the gas generator turbine. And the engine limitations, including temperatures, they will give you, for example, limit temperature in uh, interstage between a uh, uh, high temperature turbine and a uh, low temperature turbine. We call, what I call the TIT, or sometimes it is named differently. They will tell you which fuels are allowed. Normally, it would be JT, JT1 for um, commercial fuels. In some cases where you have dual use uh, with the military, then you, you, they allow also JP4 or JP8 or some other, some other fuels, kerosene and so on. It will give you key dimensions like weight, length and so on, not that very interesting sometimes. 
and there will be reference to all the technical documentation so that you need need to to consider there is interestingly no emission data uh, required to be submitted in the certification unlike the large turbo funds so you don't know what kind of uh, emissions you get out of this uh, turbo shaft engines so when engine can even uh, you know military and commercial operations for example the rolls royce allison m250 is renamed as a t63 and becomes a military engine or in other cases, a turbo shaft can be developed into a turboprop and vice versa. For example, a T700, you know, the GT700, which has been around for quite some time, has been developed into a CT7 turboprop, which powers quite a few, actually quite a few uh, uh, turboprop aircraft. So turbo shaft engines evolve over time. There are very few companies that, uh, you know, uh, have the design capability to, you know, produce uh, new turbo shaft engines. And there are fewer and fewer times. So this is very, very high tech with, the, with the, you know, very, very key information held in, in the very few, in the very few companies. So I said that you got to look at the certified fuel, jet A or others. You've got the engine limitations. Normally what you have is uh, engine speed, uh, which is a 100%, which is the sign speed, but the manufacturer will allow you a limit just above, above the sign speed. It can be a few percent, 2%, 4%, for transient or emergency operations. So they will tell you, okay, the nominal speed is 100%, but for a very sharp transient, you can have uh, a, an RPM of 104% uh, just for uh, for a short time. Now, consider that the output shaft in the P has a speed of up to 60,000 RPM. So even a 1% of, of uh, 60,000 RPM is translated into essentially 600 RPM. is is not a negligible amount, uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of of the speed. Uh, and then you have uh, the torque transmission rating, which I discussed in the previous chapter, and the gearbox transmission rating. The specific fuel consumption is defined as the fuel flow divided by the shaft power. So you got the fuel flow. Uh, obviously, that, it, that can be measured. There would be the fuel, the fuel flow meters and the shaft power. Uh, the power cannot be measured directly. What is measured is indirectly, because what you measure is a torque. There are torque meters. There are, uh, uh, you know, angular speed meters. These are, you know, well-known sort of, of devices. So whether you, if you have both torque meter and angular speed meter, you know, then you multiply the, the torque by the angular speed that you get is power. So you don't measure the power directly, you may measure it indirectly by measuring the two, the two you know, key components of uh, torque and, uh, and angular speed. So, so what you have is a specific fuel consumption. So fuel flow divided by the shaft power. Now you have to be careful as to how you calculate this because obviously as you change engine speed, the engine um, you know output, the SFC will change. And uh, the data which are generally published are uh, are given are had to be intended as you know the specific fuel consumption at uh, nominal design power, which is 100% RPM of uh, the gas turbine speed, and the fuel flow at the design point. In the standard temperature and the standard so standard day and the uh, sea level. If you move away from the standard day and from uh, sea level, and if you also you know start to move in uh, you know with the speed, then SFC would be different. Therefore, SFC is not just a number. SFC is a chart, and I'm going to show you an example uh, later on. So the units of SFC that you will find in the literature lots lots of units. And um, of course, there will be units in the international system, there will be units uh, which are in imperial uh, system, and it's very difficult sometimes to go from one to the other. So conversion is, is, is required all the time. So I use uh, international uh, you know, metrics, metric, metric units, so the, the, this SFC will be given in kilograms per second per kilowatt of output power. The United States, uh, obviously, they keep using imperial units, uh, they're not going to change uh, for the next uh, 200 years. So their uh, uh, SFC are given uh, in uh, pound per hour per pound. No, no pound is, is a force. And uh, the hour is the same uh, in imperial as this in uh, metric units, luckily. Uh, but the fact is in metric units, you've got both uh, weights and mass. So for example, our definition up here of kilograms per second per kilowatt could be kilograms mass per second per kilowatt, but it may as well be kilogram force per second per kilowatt. So it makes the things slightly confusing because if you have a kilogram force, then it would be 9.81 times the kilogram mass. In the case of US imperial units, so you got only a pound of force. 
you know, sometimes I've seen somewhere that they try to use a pound mass, but I mean, I think it's uh, ridiculous because this is imperially units is not, is not, uh, you know, metric. Therefore, they, they don't have uh, uh, the, the, the mass, uh, the mass unit. Anyway, let's look at the chart we have on this page here. So you've got SFC one on one axis and you've got the shaft power on the other axis. And the, the, the data are all over the place. I mean, that there is, I have drawn a trend in there. There's a linear trend, uh, which is based on, on the best fit the linear square, but ultimately the only thing that shows is that the bigger, the bigger the engine or the higher the, the shaft power, the, the better the better is the, um, the SFC. But more than that, really cannot draw a conclusion because there is too much difference, particularly at intermediate power ratings. You can see what kind of difference, you know, this 50% difference in uh, SFC. Now to say that this chart doesn't tell you very much about the real technology because you would have to ask yourself this, you know, same technology. Are we talking about engines which have been uh, designed for example in 1955 with the engines have been designed in 2015 yeah this is not shown in here okay but nevertheless even if you were to correct by technology advancement you find there is quite a variety in the sfc numbers and the, my view is that uh, these numbers cannot always be trusted so if you were to get a job where you need to go and uh, secure a new engine and uh, you were to ask yourself whether you should secure a new engine purchase or leasing or whatever you need to do based on all your SFC data, I think you'll be doing a great mistake looking at charts like this, because using the use FSC is not by itself a good uh, a good measure of performance. There are so many, so many items you need to consider. And the fact that the data are so scattered on a, on a simple two-dimensional chart, we should tell you that the judging the performance of an engine is not gonna be a question of just a single uh, metric. So the operational performance, uh, of course, that will be affected by flight altitude. Our flight altitude will be obviously from sea level to wherever the, the, the rotorcraft is able to achieve. We'll see that this altitude is not going to be outstanding, at least compared to fixed wing aircraft. Outside temperature can be anything. Of course, you would expect to be able to operate between minus 30 degrees Celsius easily and at least 40 plus. So we got a, var a variation of temperature at sea level of the order of 70 degrees. And you see that uh, turboshaft engines just don't like this variation of temperature. It just, they just hate it. Uh, and then you need to consider uh, the effects of engine deterioration and the various external factors. So I'm going to discuss this uh, separately. So the first thing we do, we look at the chart of one of those um, engines that you can uh, find uh, for manufacturers. This is Rolls-Royce Allison uh, M250 or C20B, there are various names for this engine. Originally it was Allison, so those, this is an American engine, but because the company was uh, acquired by Rolls-Royce, now it's a Rolls-Royce Allison engine. It's not an engine designed yesterday, it's, it's, you know, as, as many other engines have been designed uh, many years ago, but look at this uh, chart here where you have uh, the, the flight altitude in, uh, in feet of the horizontal axis and you got the, the power, in this case, uh, horsepower. You know, obviously this is not been written for the, the metric people is written for the imperial people and they uh, got the shaft of horsepower. So they can you all this line. Let's take the yellow line, which is uh, the standard of the day. On the standard day, you have a power output of the order of uh, 430 shaft power, horsepower at sea level. And that is uh, decreasing to about 230 at 20,000 feet. 20,000 feet is the highest altitude realistically you can get from a rotorcraft. So from 430 to 30, you lost about 40% of your power. This is just the effect of altitude. So this is the thing that uh, the turboshaft engines just uh, hate the high altitude. And in fact, it turns out that they also hate high temperature. If you look at the standard day plus 40 degrees, actually that's extreme, that's probably too much. Let's say standard day plus 20 degrees is more realistic. So that means that the sea level, <clears throat> you would have uh, 35 degrees. Uh, not unusual in many places in the world, uh, uh, at least in the summer. <coughs> so your 430 uh, horsepower has decreased now to 370, 300, uh, no, 380, maybe 380. So you've got quite a loss of power in there, about 40 to 50 kilowatts, just because temperature has gone up about 20 degrees. That's an enormous amount of power. And uh, you know there is a reflected the total altitudes. Although the most uh, the most uh, glaring example is uh, sea level. You can see with other other temperature standard plus 40 degrees, just an extreme case. 
Then you have a temperature of a standard minus 20. It's a cold day, but not really cold because it would be minus five. If you go up uh, up north in, in, you know, I don't know, North America, Canada, obviously Russia, North Europe and so on, you know, you have to talk about uh, very, very, very cold temperatures, even minus, uh, minus 30. So standard temperature minus 20 degrees means minus five. So what you need is minus 20 degrees, which means minus, minus 35 compared to the standard atmosphere. <laughs> So there you go. So you get a gain. You get a gain in 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 shaft power up to 460 sea level. So very good. So this is estimated performance at 100% uh, N2 RPM, which means the design speed. So the engine, what it means is just running full speed is by design, and uh, uh, it's not to throttle down yet. Just a, just a test. This is a chart which you, you may want to ask yourself: How do you generate this chart? I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it is notional, it would be a simulation, that there, there is no other way to do this, this is a simulation because uh, obviously this is static, you know, it's static at 20,000 feet, how can you get an experiment 20,000 feet, you know, static, you've got to be able to fly, you can't stand up uh, anywhere, uh, steady state at 20,000 feet, so this is, this is a simulation. Another case is shown here for another engine is the Turbo Mega Safran Ariel 2C2. This powers the, the EC, well, there's a tab here. This is the EC 365, not 2165, 365. So these are data elaborated from industry briefs, uh, certification documents. So I, I put all the data in some chart and then I plot them. And uh, so what I have is uninstalled and installed data. So the symbols here are MCP, which is maximum continuous power. MTOP is maximum takeoff power. Then you have a maximum emergency power, MEP. M MEP2 is maximum emergency power for two minutes. Or EI is the emergency power when the engine is operating with one engine and operative in the installations where you have a twin engine, twin engine ops. So you take any curve you like in this. So just take the maximum continuous power. And what you have here is the outside air temperature outside air temperature and the shaft output power in a kilowatt this time because i've done it so i use metric 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 uh, uh, units so as you go up in the air temperature the maximum continuous power decreases sharply from uh, about uh, probably 600 kilowatt to 400 and um, 440 430 i mean it's quite a sharp power now 50 degrees is very hot but nevertheless when you do design uh, design helicopters, engines, or whatever, you've got to consider the most extreme situations. Otherwise, you just limit uh, where you can go with your uh, with your vehicle. And after you spend a lot of money, you say, you know, I cannot operate in too cold weather. I cannot operate in too hot weather. I cannot operate at too high altitude. So what did you buy? So you have to be careful about what uh, what uh, you know your purchase and what you're operating. You need to be knowing exactly what is the envelope of your rotorcraft. So I've taken the dashed line for this are an uninstalled power, and this is taken from an official document, certification document from the Federal Aviation Administration. So it's a, it's an it's an engine certification 45 EN. So to just give you an idea, what is the effect of outside the air temperature, even at the constant altitude? This would be constant altitude and the speed equal to zero. More on atmospheric temperature. This is the Allison CTS 800 turbo shaft Allison or or uh, Rolls Royce. And it's also interesting. So you see a number of, of lines in here. I would suggest that you just review this as you as you revise your your material. So you have a number of lines. So if you take the lines which are straight lines with the negative slope pointing you know down uh, to the right. So what you have is uh, obviously lines which are constant altitude. So I'm talking about these lines here. Okay, this this one. So going into this direction here. So this red uh, black line is uh, sea level, okay? So again, you've got the outside air temperature. And being American, of course, now we got uh, th 32. Uh, so good Fahrenheit, so 30 Fahrenheit, 30, 32, roughly this one would be zero Celsius, okay? So it'll be zero Celsius. And minus 40 uh, Fahrenheit is equal to minus 40 Celsius. At least I know that. So basically, we have within uh, 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, you have, uh, um, yeah, 40 degrees, 40 degrees Celsius, that sort of thing. So 120, I think, is about uh, 40 degrees plus 40 degrees on the ground. 
So what you have is a got sea level, which is this line here on top. And then you move up uh, to 4,000 feet. 4,000 feet, you get a power which is considerably lower. So if you take any temperature, like let's call it 40, 40 degrees Fahrenheit would be this line here. Okay, so this is the power you would expect at the sea level. You go up 4,000 uh, feet, you get this power. 8,000 feet, you get this power. 12,000 feet, you get this power. You know, you start seeing very sharp decreases in power. You know, 20,000 feet, which is really the limit of what you can expect. So you've got 800 uh, shaft power horsepower when you start from uh, over 1,800. It's basically your power available. The power available is decreased by over 50%. This is not a good thing. So you will see when we do the aerodynamics as the shaft power decreases, the engine shaft power decreases, the power required to hover and fly increases very sharply. So that, that puts really a limit to how far you can go up with the helicopter. So if you take any of these lines, uh, the effects of the outside air temperature is effectively linear. So the SL, the 4,000 feet, 8,000 feet and so on lines are essentially uh, constant. Then there is a number of other lines, which are these uh, dashed lines. So the dashed line is, uh, for example, this one is in the standard international atmosphere. This one is uh, a standard atmosphere plus 20 degrees, and this is standard atmosphere plus 40 degrees. Now, if you've got a bit of a sharp eye, you will notice that uh, the increase in temperature here is given in uh, Celsius, you know, Celsius, whilst the, the, the chart has been uh, uh, drawn uh, with, uh, with a Fahrenheit in there. So uh, whoever has been drawing this chart, I uh, just can't decide, you know, how to, 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 to you know, to show the data. But this is what uh, often you find in industry, in industry documents that, you know, whenever you start to mix in uh, uh, units, then uh, then it really gets slightly confusing. But that's how they do it. So you got uh, a standard day minus 20 degrees, a standard day is minus 40 degrees. So you got very, very cold temperatures. So on each of this, you know, you can move around the constant, a constant line uh, of temperature, which means essentially if you are at sea level, you got this temperature here, which is about 15 degrees. And then the temperature would increase by about 6.9 uh, degrees every thousand meters or a uh, thousand meters is about uh, 3000 feet, that sort of things. So you can sort of gauge what is, uh, what is the gradient in there. So, but if you have a constant temperature, you know, on a sea level and you go up, your, temp your, your shaft power decreases like this. If you're on a hot day, your shaft power degrees is like this on a very hot, this is a desert. Plus 40 means desert degree. And minus 40 would be the Arctic, Arctic temperature. I, I need to warn about the Arctic temperature because normally an Arctic temperature would be temperature inversions. So temperature generally is not like a normal temperature. The temperature as you go up, the temperature goes down. Sometimes it goes up and then comes back up down so so uh, there is a temperature inversion in that case it, it is also interesting to know that there is this kink at this temperature here so i just wonder what the reason is for this so if anybody i want your students to know what this problem is just think about and just give me an answer and uh, we'll uh, can discuss together as to why it would be that you know you get to this temperature for example a sea level you know you get a temperature which is of the order of maybe minus uh uh, what is it? Ice are minus uh, 30, let's call it minus, uh, minus 30, and the power doesn't keep going up, but the power is limited. So it's more almost constant. So it would be interesting to know if you have an idea, just let me know, just write, write to me. So this is an example of a uh, of flat envelope for, uh, for a turbo shaft engine. So this is the effect of outside air temperature, the effect of, air, of, uh, of uh, flat altitude as well. So here I elaborated a number of data for you if you want to look at the uh, industry data. So PR is the overall pressure ratio. By the way, there is a, a nomenclature document in the Blackboard so you can look at the nomenclature there just in case you don't know what, what each symbol means. Because sometimes I won't say everything. So we've got a number of engines in here. You got the, the, the you know official uh, weight of the engine, the takeoff power, the maximum continuous power, two emergency power ratings, two minutes and 30 seconds to the sign uh, um, the pressure, pressure, uh, overall pressure ratio, the SFC, which is discussed earlier. This is the mass flow. This is uh, the, the, you know, the, the mass flow into the engine. And this is the RPM uh, at, at the shaft, uh, shaft output. So if you got a 6,000 RPM, then uh, this, uh, this uh, aircraft powering uh, rotor 250 RPM, 
then what you have is a, is a, is a reduction ratio from 6,000 to 250. So just to give you an idea of what kind of uh, reduction ratio you need there. So what you do, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, you know, it is not always possible to do a, a flight testing of all these engines. So e-simulation has become more and more important. The fact is, uh, is, is key to everything. So the engine normally sold as one decompressible flow. There are also opportunities for doing steady state, transient operations, impulsive uh, uh, cases. And there are a number of other codes, codes available uh, out there, uh, not all available for free. For example, there's NPSS. If you link on this, uh, on this uh, line here, you can find information which originally was generated from NASA. And now this is a code which is maintained by, jointly by several engine manufacturers. We do have a copy of this version and we got uh, some research ongoing with at least two PhD students with NPSS. And then we got the GSP, which is from NLR in the Netherlands. Again, this has been generated over many, many years. It's an industry standard and we use this. I use this all the time. There are others. Um, there is one, for example, used widely in industry. It's been developed at Comfort University, it's too much. There are other, other ones that you can find that just as research codes. But that's the important thing is, you know, is that this is uh, the, the engine is of this one dimensional compressible flow if you want to look, you know, at the overall performance. So this is how the engines are effectively, you know, modeled. Essentially, you've got the inlet, you've got a compressor, then you have a combustor, then you have, uh, uh, a, you know, a, a compressor turbine. It's called the compressor turbine or gas generator turbine. You've got the power turbine here. Finally, you've got the exhaust. You've got some numbers. These numbers are actually standard. So you've got uh, the inlet is called one. The a, 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 a entrance to the compressor is called section two. The exit uh, or the compressor or the entrance to the combustor is called the three and so on. And this point 4.5, 4.5 is what we called earlier the inter turbine temperature, TIT, or T4.5 would be a, a datum that you find in the certification documents, many certification documents. You find the temperatures, temperatures at, at that point. So if you were to you know, look at uh, what kind of temperatures you need to uh, take care of, there would be that point there or also that point there. So the exit, the exit of uh, the last uh, turbine stage. There will be a fuel control. So the fuel comes in here, goes into the combustor. And it'll be a control load, obviously, because you've got a power turbine. The power turbine is rotating at constant RPM and uh, that will uh, be receiving all the torque from uh, the main rotor. And finally, there will be a control bleed. The control bleed is uh, pressurized air and goes out to this point here and is used for running some uh, on board, on board systems, could be avionics, could be, you know, air conditioning, cooling, heating, and so on. This is done either through the control bleed or through a separate uh, uh, engine called APU, which is the auxiliary power units. Okay, so these are standard definitions. You probably find them uh, the same in uh, in uh, in costs of advanced advanced power or advanced uh, aero propulsion. So if you look at the turbo shaft performance, we've got, uh, I, I simulated in this case, the T700-100 steady state. The SFC, you remember, is now is uh, the ratio between uh, uh, the um, uh, fuel flow. The fuel flow is called the WF6. Why is it called that way? It's because it's, uh, F is, uh, is a fuel, so is the mass flow. F is the fuel and 6 is the section in the engine when this is actually taken. And P shaft is the shaft power. So if you were to look at uh, the, the SFC, which is the, the right graph in here, you see that this is not constant. So let's take, for example, one line, the line at the sea level. So the line at sea level is uh, this blue line. Perhaps I should change the color of my own pen. So you get this, this thing here, so that one. So the minimum is obtained roughly at the, at the maximum fuel flow. So the maximum fuel flow would be, we would plot this as well in terms of uh, of, uh, of RPM, so the maximum, uh, the maximum, uh, so the best, the best FC or minimum, minimum value would be at the full speed, full speed of maximum fuel flow. And as you reduce the fuel flow, the specific consumption becomes very, very high. So why is that? The reason is that the shaft power goes down much faster than the fuel flow. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is that as you slow down the engine, you still need to deliver fuel flow in order to maintain the rotating machinery at some speed. So there are always an idle fuel flow. When you're in idle, you don't produce a, a net, net power, but you're burning fuel. At that point, SFC is basically infinite. And that doesn't make any sense. 
So what happens is that uh, in idle conditions, the SFC is not a good indicator of performance. In the idle condition, you have a fuel flow only. So we'll give you a minimum fuel flow in idle, but there is no effective shaft power. And that shows why this number goes up. You know, if, obviously you can't go less than about 0 0.4, 0 0.04 kilograms per second. If you were to be going down, I mean, you just can't, you need to maintain a minimum fuel flow in order to run, run the engine. And this, this fuel consumption essentially means that this goes sharply up because there is, there is no shaft power. And as you go up in altitude, so this is a, a continuous power. So this is a true airspeed equal to zero. So this static engine, you go to high altitudes of say 8,000 meters, you can get some very good fuel consumption there. So at that point, the fuel consumption is best at this intermediate value, so fuel flow. And you can see that you can draw a map if you wish. You can draw a map of minimum uh, uh, fuel consumption or minimum SFC depending on, on the flight altitude. But obviously you cannot control this all the time because it depends on your flight condition and your all up weight and, and so on. But anyway, this is what uh, what happens in the performance of the engine. I have some lines in here. This is what we call the TT5 limit. So essentially what it means is this. If I go back to the previous drawing, uh, this one here. So this is section five. A section five, which is essentially the temperature at the exit of the last stage of the turbine, there is a limit temperature that the, the engine is being designed for. And if you if you exceed that the, the temperature, basically you are creating uh, extra loads uh, on on the engine, which are uh, thermal and the fatigue. Therefore, you try not to exceed the temperature. So in this particular chart we're done, this is the TT5 limit, which is given by the official documents. And at that point, you say you know you cannot deliver more than that. And I just draw a line in there. That's it. Now let's look at the chart to the left of the page. So what you have is uh, is the shaft uh, path, uh, output. And again, you have lines uh, which are at constant altitude. So this line here is a sea level. Uh, the good thing is that, oh, sorry, the line isn't very good in there. So is uh, you get a shaft power, which is, uh, uh, which is basically linear. So you see here, you increase the fuel flow, um, the, um, the power is linear. And you get to a point where the, you get a limit because the TT5, the, the, you know, the, the total temperature, the extra last stage of the turbine is reached. You cannot deliver any more, any more power. And the, the, um, the power you can uh, get out of the, the engine goes down as, uh, as the aircraft flies higher. So the, the power just goes in this way. So this is the 8,000 meter line. Um, it's over 20,000 feet, 24,000 feet in there. So you won't get many, many, many aircraft flying at that altitude. So I've drawn this line here in red, which is the TT5 limit. Again, maximum continuous power, uh, static conditions. This can only be simulation because at 10,000 meters, you can't get an engine to fly at zero speed. Well, with a rotorcraft, you can, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's best to have uh, you know, a good array of uh, simulations so you can get the whole envelope. And when you do the flight testing, then you go and flight test just a uh, you know, very limited number of, of cases and, uh, in the envelope because flight testing is extremely expensive. Okay, so what happens here is that obviously we, we try to, to, to gauge uh, some uh, understanding in how the engine can, simulate, can be simulated. So as I said, uh, we use at least the two uh, models for, uh, for turboshaft engines. One is NPSS and another one is GSP. And um, you've got, uh, you know, the, the, the power lapse with altitude is all over the place. So uh, how do you think the power should lapse with altitude? Yeah, that's, uh, that's anybody's guess because the two simulations, the blue line and the green line are, are very different. So we haven't, we haven't cracked this, uh, this nut yet. But what I've done, I added a number of other, of other lines. So standard days, if you take the standard day, so essentially you've got uh, the normalized power, assuming that the you know, normalized power is maximum, it would be equal to one at sea level. And of course that decreases with altitude. And the black line is like uh, asking uh, the, the, the engine to decrease its, uh, its power, the same as uh, sigma, which is the relative air density. So sigma uh, um, is, uh, is a rho divided by rho uh, naught. So where rho is the air density uh, at altitude, then rho naught is the, is the air density at the sea level. So this we'll call sigma. 
and this is the the, the relative um, uh, density of density altitude. So if I basically scale my power with the sigma, I got the red line, so the black line, and the black line is not too far off from uh, the uh, NPSS simulation. But if I scale with the sigma to the power 0.8, then what I find is that uh, actually they're pretty close. A GSP and, and the sigma to the power 0 0.8 uh, is very close. In fact, uh, the reason why I use this uh, sigma to power 0 0.8 is because it's actually very common in all, uh, uh, you know, first order simulation of uh, uh, aero engines and also in, in rotorcraft simulations. So this is what we'll be doing. So I'll have to figure out why NP, NPS simulation is, is that different. So just to give you a, a flavor of, of the fact that, you know, even one simulation code you want to really illuminate you on the actual performance of the engine you have to do a lot of debugging a lot of understanding of how things are going it could be a doing something wrong with your uh, with your assumptions so it could be there is something wrong with the model itself you know there are many many things that, that can can go wrong and uh, you know trying to understand what can be in a long simulation chain is actually a very difficult engineering problem so just to give you that these are two industry codes giving you two different answers for the same engine So we've done it again for a different uh, for a different uh, um, sort of um, condition, condition. So this is again a T700 turbo shaft. So this is the power turbine torque. So we measure the power turbine torque, which is what is actually goes out uh, to, to go and deliver the to the, to the main rotor. We've got some uh, NASA test points, which are these uh, orange lines, and the, both NPSS and uh, and the GSP uh, were were unable to deliver the same the same uh, results although NPSS seems to be uh, closer. So over a range of uh, over fuel flow. This was done by one of my PhD students. So uh, he, was, he was one of those who actually started like yourself, uh, taking the course of helicopters a number of years ago. And uh, he, he, he came uh, you know, to do further studies and uh, he's become an expert in, in aero engine simulation and aero engine uh, deterioration. Maybe I'll say a few words uh, um, you know, later on. Okay, so it is important also to understand the role of uh, uh, emissions in, in aviation. And uh, unfortunately for turbo shaft and turbo prop, uh, there isn't very much. So what we know is that uh, there are some uh, studies for T700, you know, these are NASA st studies that are very old, the 1980s. And there are three, three uh, um, emission, uh, you know, chemicals that we are interested uh, on. One is a UHC. UHC is uncombust hydrocarbons. NOx is uh, you know nitrogen oxides, and CO is uh, is carbon monoxide. And uh, so finding how this change uh, with the temperature is uh, is very difficult. It depends on uh, very much on uh, the actual conditions on the engine, in the in engine, in particular the combustor inter inlet temperature and the combustor in inlet uh, uh, pressure. So in this case, I show one uh, one sort of uh, estimate I've done based on combustor inlet temperature. If you go back to the chart where I show you the sections of the engine, you find that it would be the temperature T T three. Double T means total temperature. If it was just a single T, it would be temperature static temperature so a single t would be static temperature and double t would be total temperature so this is what happens so this is the emission index of of nox here we've got the index uh, emission index of uh, co carbon monoxide we've got this these two different fuels so it's important also to choose the fuels and just to give in a ballpark number here we have there's a change in emission index of the order of 0.01 per degree kelvin so as you increase the, the temperature in the combustor, you increase your emission of noxes or NOx. And uh, however, if you increase uh, the temperature in the inlet, in the combustor, what you have is a decrease in the CO. And this is a bit frustrating because uh, that leaves you with a question of what am I going to do now? So here, I mean, this line here, which I'm going to draw like this. So the steepest line would be equivalent to, to a, 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 de a decrease in the CO of the order of 0.2 per degree Kelvin. So this is uh, this is a bit disappointing because uh, very often in engineering, you do something <clears throat> which has a beneficial effect on something, and then it is uh, a, an opposite effect on, on a different parameter. So if you were to choose uh, what is the best, uh, uh, you know, uh, combustor inlet temperature here, you're really struggling because uh, what you have is if you take the two curves, uh, you take one here, right, and one going up, then perhaps the best would be somewhere in between. 
so the, the combustor temperature will have to be high, but not too high because that would, uh, you know, while you, you decrease uh, uh, the NOx, then you also increase the CO. But you have to be careful when you're doing this because you're comparing one, one parameter with another parameter. So you need to ask yourself whether it's more important to decrease NOx or to decrease CO. So, so this is another area of research and, uh, you know, one of our expertise is to work on, on our aero engines for helicopters and that there is nothing that's been published and the industry will not publish anything on this. Of course, you try to do the best that you can for the data you have. So we compare the, the performance, the performance of uh, uh, turbo shaft engines with the performance of uh, modern turbo fans. So what I've done here, I've taken uh, uh, some data, you know, uh, with a bit of a few hours overnight. And uh, so what I've done is I've taken, you know, the, the fuel flow in here, the sun fuel flow, taken the pressure ratio, the sun pressure ratio, and I calculated, you know, what is corresponding NOx emissions. So here I've got all uh, variety of uh, uh, turbofans. These are the modern turbofans, which have a very low, very low emissions. And the, and the turbo shafts are down here. You know, they're a tiny, tiny bit in a tiny corner sitting very, very nicely that corner. But, you know, it shows even the big, uh, the big turbo shaft engines, the fact that they are uh, Mickey Mouse compared to the modern, uh, the modern, uh, a high bypass turbofan engines, which have enormous uh, uh, fuel flow rates. You can see fuel flow rates of four kilograms per second, pressure ratios of 45, you know, but also emit a lot of, uh, of NOx. So anyway, these data are not really published, so we can't, we can't really do much on, uh, on emissions of turbo shaft engines. And I would like to remind you that, uh, you know, uh, aviation emissions are very important. It's part of our responsibility to look at ways to reduce emissions. And therefore, we need to understand, you know, what these engines are producing. So multi-engine rotorcraft. So there, this is an interesting problem that I'd like you to, to reflect a bit on. So I talked before about uh, the the twin engine rotorcraft, but if we have a three, three engine rotorcraft, so let's take about the very big base of rotorcraft, like, you know, the Sea King or uh, any other big, big, big uh, aircraft. So if you fly at loiter speed, the loiter speed, I'll, I'm going to discuss it many times uh, uh, later on. The loiter speed is the speed of minimum power. Okay. So there are, there are, there is a range where you can fly and, uh, and uh, the, there is a, there is a point that depending on weight and atmospheric conditions where, uh, you know, the fuel flow is minimum. So the idea is that can you disengage one engine and operate only with the two engines? So what is the effect on SFC? So assume that we need, uh, you know, uh, hypothetically 2,400 kilowatt of power. Okay, just, I've not done the calculations, but just let's assume, I'm assuming 2,400 because that's a nice number. Uh, what it means is that if I divide by three, then my, my output power is 800 kilowatt per engine. So that's, that's something I can do very easily on the back of the envelope. I don't need to calculate anything. So assume that this three engine rotorcraft requires 2,400 kilowatt of power in a loiter speed. So what I'm asking to deliver is 800 kilowatt per engine. Now, what I'm going to find out, because we have simulated among the various engines, also this engine here, which is the RTM 322. So what have we got here? So we've got in this complicated chart, we've got the speed, so the, the, the gas generator turbi uh, turbine is operating at speeds between 75% and 100%. Okay, and then we have uh, two uh, axes, two vertical axes. One is the shaft power on the left, and then you have SFC on, on the right. So SFC given in kilograms per kilowatt per hour. Now, what I'm saying is this, the power is the blue line. So the power essentially goes up with, uh, with the gas generator turbine. And uh, so obviously when you're at the same point, uh, what you get is uh, this design power. So the design power is, uh, you have to read on, on the chart, oh, sorry, on the scale to the, uh, to the left. So the design power here would be of the order of maybe 1400, 1400 kilowatt, okay? And if you spool down, uh, the decrease in power is uh, almost linear. I would say that's certainly linear up to the point when you reach roughly 85% RPM, at which point can, there is an inflection here. So it's not quite uh, as simple as that. Now, if you have a three engine operations, so three in engine operations, each of them, I said I need to deliver 800 kilowatt. So at 800 kilowatt, if I go on this power curve, at 800 kilowatt, each engine is operated at 90, so this is 91.5% RPM. So there would be 91, 
no, 91, uh, so be 91.5%. Uh, so the operating point is this uh, uh, red dot. So this is the three engine operation. However, I can do another thing. I can disengage a twisting principle. I can disengage one engine and let the other two engines operate at the required 1200 kilowatt. So 1200 kilowatt plus 1200 kilowatts deliver exactly what I need, 12, uh, 2400 kilowatt. So my operation point, essentially the power required that would be here. So this point here, that would be, uh, there was the power required before, now the power required here. So you see there's quite a linear behavior, uh, you know, from one point to the other. But interestingly, is when you have a three in engine operations, you get the red spot, which will give you this FC. And when you have a two engine operations, the operating point is at this green dot. So the green dot point is a lower SFC. So bingo, here we have the solution that if you can design a system that can disengage an engine, a three, you know, a three engine aircraft, you may have a gain in SFC from about 0 0.3, this is 0 0.3, this was 0 0.30, 31 and a half. You can calculate the percentage of the improvement. It's quite considerable. So just do these calculations yourself and see what is the improvement in the fuel flow in there. And that's, you know, what, 7%, 8%? I don't know, I need to sit down and, and do this, but it's quite a considerable amount of fuel savings by just disengaging one engine and operating a twin engine instead of, of, a, of a three engine. So this is one thing you want, you want to consider in terms of optimizing. And of course, uh, less fuel, less fuel burn, less emissions, less uh, fuel cost, less uh, of uh, just about everything, except that perhaps uh, I would say not everything is uh, rosy here because what you need to do is, uh, of course, you've got more maintenance on the operating engines. You have less maintenance on, uh, on the engine that has been disengaged. So you may ask yourself, can you disengage always the same engine or you can you rotate, can you rotate, you know, the disengagement of the engines? So it's, it's, it's a nice case case. I would like you to, to work it out when, uh, when you revise this uh, notes. So uh, one other thing I've done is uh, doing uh, the transient, so we can do the transient analysis for uh, for uh, a, a, a rot a rotorcraft engine. So what we've done here, this is the RDL 2C2 that I mentioned earlier. So we have is an airflow, and then uh, you have a sharp increase in airflow and the fuel flow. So interestingly, you know, the engine stabilizes within, uh, you know, basically a second. This is interesting because if you have a high bypass tube of an engine, it would take five to 10 seconds to stabilize. So this is interesting because within uh, within a second or even less than a second, the engine responds very sharply to the power requirement. But if you had a big monster, you know, turbofans, it takes up to 10 seconds when you spool up in order to get the delivery, delivery of, uh, of the required thrust. So that's the difference between, you know, a small compact engine like a turbo shaft and very big uh, humongous turbofan that delivers, you know, 100,000 uh, uh, pounds of, of thrust, that sort of thing. So you got the fuel flow again. The one is stabilized there. So obviously there is a bit of time lag, but that's that's not big deal. I would say that this is an engine that responds very fast to an increase, a decrease in uh, in uh, in control loads. The next thing we look at is the power losses and the deterioration. Over time, believe it or not, uh, engines uh, tend to you know uh, get tired of operating efficiently. And here I got a chart where I have uh, the number of hours of operation. I've exaggerated a bit. To be quite honest, because what I have is a number of hours of operation 200. If every every rotor craft engine operated like this, then there would be no no helicopters flying in the sky. Uh, certainly, if you operate in the UK, that to 200 that would become about 800 easily, maybe it becomes a thousand hours. But if you operate in the hot uh, uh, areas of the world where there is a desert dust or that kind of thing, the 200 hours is very realistic. Now, when you go and get the engine from Ross Royce or anybody else, you know, or GA or Peter Pritt and W, so what you do is you you, you define and you, you want you want a, a power output and uh, you want to be delivered 100%. So you got a contract when you deliver. So for example, if you want 2,000 kilowatts, your 100% uh, would be 2,000 kilowatts. But I mean, how do you calculate the 2,000 uh, kilowatt? It would have to be uninstalled power because uh, Ross Royce or Allison, whoever, really don't know very much about how you know you're going to install the engine. Perhaps they will tell you, you know, but usually there is a reluctance between the two industries to share data. 
Okay, so when you actually sign a contract, you sign a contract for 100%. Now, to be on the safe side, I know that many industries, many manufacturers will deliver a bit more. So instead of delivering the contracted 100% power, they will deliver maybe 102%, so to speak. So when you get the engine uninstalled, the power is this thing here. You got a bonus or 2% or 3%. That's your bonus. However, you have to be careful not to not to overspend your bonus because unless you design very well your intake and your uh, you know engine airframe integration your 2% bonus you know may drop over there and all of a sudden your bonus is gone so that's that's a very difficult thing to do so the airframe engine integration is is uh, something for really the master designers anyway let's assume that you got that power there over time the power decreases and you get to a point where by the time, by the time you get to 96% of the sun power delivered by the engine, there is a reject point. Now I would say this reject depends very much on who's operating the helicopter. If it is a military helicopter, it's probably likely to be rejected. If it is a commercial helicopter flying lightly, perhaps that 96% that can be going down to, I don't know, something like here which means you can operate an extra, in this case, in this particular chart, you can operate an extra 40 hours before you can do a complete overhaul of the engine. So all this depends on the way you operate, how often you operate, what kind of atmosphere you fly, and you know what kind of, of operations you do. But this curve is quite general. And the general comment here is that the, the power output goes down over time. How fast it goes down depends, I would say. But there is a point at which the power goes below your threshold, you cannot do the things you wanted to do at the point you have to go back into the shop and uh, and do a bit of a, of a cleanup and the maintenance. So the new engine is delivered with a higher power than output by contract. So you get a bit of a bonus on that. So what are the origins of, of a power losses? So once you get a, you know get in the situation of reject, you want to be able to know you know what's what's uh, you know destroying your engine. It could be compressor fooling because you are you're drawing dirty air, compressor blades erosion. Again, you're getting uh, dirty stuff inside, and uh, sooner or later the blades are eroded. You got turbine wear. You got blockages all around. The intake distortion because of fatigue, thermal fatigue. So the aerodynamic parts are not as good as the wind by design. You got combustor efficiency because you know the the fuel holes are a bit uh, you know glazed, or because uh, there are uh, impurities that go stuck in there and go glazed, and so on. There are various other causes, and uh, and this is part of, of a lot of, of rotorcraft engine research uh, these days. So turboshaft engine uh, deterioration, so include just to be, be quick thermal loads, for example, high temperatures, centrifugal loads, if you operate at very high speeds. So it means, you know, if you can operate at lower speeds, lower lower power outputs, then, you know, you reduce your centrifugal loads. You got pressure and dynamic loads. You do lots of, of uh, you know, transients, as I said, one I was mentioning before that you simulate. You got cycle fatigue on the rotating parts. Never forget that these parts rotate at many, many thousands of RPMs. So you got the blade, disc, compressions, turbines, that all this get, you know, really damaged over time. Then you got the steady fatigue, for example, combustors, you got the nozzle, you got the veins, and so on. And dust ingestion, ash environments, foreign object debris, you can ingest all sorts of things into, into an aero engine. You know, you can ingest, uh, uh, I don't know, dust, uh, sand, uh, uh, dead leaves from trees, uh, ice, rain, and so on. Particularly rain, rain if it is near seas, you know you got uh, you got salty rain and that causes erosion, erosion of the casings, the blade clearances, and so on. So there are lots of reasons for why the engine would sort of uh, loses loses power. And then you got the systems the duration, for example, the compressor bleed, the various leakages of all systems. So the main consequence is that you got an increase in specific fuel consumption which means, you know, of course, it will cost you more to run the helicopter. You've got an increase in temperatures in parts of the engine. This, the FADEC will tell you, or, uh, you know, the, the flight data recorder. And therefore, you may end up with a lower, lower margin for the exhaust gas uh, turbine. So hopefully you do more of this when you do advanced, uh, advanced power or uh, aero engines. But this is as much as I can say so far, as far as we're concerned for, with helicopters. So the next step is, uh, you know, once we understand what the, the rotorcraft engine does, is uh, a, you know have an aeromechanic model, which is what we're going to spend a few weeks on to develop an aeromechanic model for the rotorcraft. So what we have is a flight state. The flight state is defined by the altitude, the true airspeed, 
the change in temperature with respect to standard day and the all up weight. Once you have all this, you find the rotorcraft power. From there, you calculated the engine power. From the engine power, you calculated the engine state. The engine state is the set of all parameters that will be, you know, at that operating point, like the fuel flow. The, so FW1 is the airflow, the fuel flow, the temperatures in the various sections of, of the engine. And from there, particularly from the fuel flow, you got the speed which was given there. So you got the speed and then you have the fuel flow in there. So what you get is this, this new parameter, which is the ratio between true speed and fuel flow, and it's called SAR. SAR is the specific air range. So the specific air range is how far you can go by burning one kilogram of fuel. That's very important, but it's all important, I have to stress, when you're flying steady state. If you are like in rotorcraft often and doing operations in hover, SAR is not useful because obviously the speed is zero, you got a few flows, so SAR will be automatically zero in hover. Uh, when you go in hover, this is uh, this is zero. So in hover, we have a different a different type of parameter. In hover, we have the endurance parameter. That means how much you can last by burning a few, you know, one kilogram of fuel. So that's just about it. Uh, so we we'll look very briefly at uh, an estimate of integration losses. So as I said, you know, you're lucky if the the, the manufacturer will deliver. Uh, by contract, maybe 2%, but don't forget that if you design badly your intake, then you get 1% to 4% losses uh, just due to intake pressure. You can lose uh, up to 2% because of exhausted back pressure due to friction. Then you can lose 3 to 15% uh, if you have a military helicopter, you got infrared suppression. Compressor bleed is very important because you need to have to run your onboard systems. Depending on how hard you run them, you can lose up to 20%. And then you have uh, engine mounted accessories that can be several kilowatt, like the intake particle separators, which will be part of the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, presentation that can be three to 10%. So you can't have all of this. I would say, you know, perhaps we can easily, you know, uh, remove this because this is, this is really uh, uh, something for the very few. So we can remove this. Uh, the compressor bleed, uh, you know, is something that you want to be careful. You, ca you can't afford to run all this. Engine mounted accessories, you can remove, you can <coughs> limit them. Intake particle separators, you get, you've got to get rid of them as soon as you can. Only use them, uh, you know, when uh, the atmosphere you're flying to requires that. So the intake particle separators should be on off, depending on, uh, on the way you're flying. Otherwise, your helicopter becomes unaffordable. Okay, so that's it. So this closes this uh, the session, and I'll see you in the next one.